Hello, my name is Tim Clark. This is Conversations about the Vietnam War. And uh, my guest today is Marianne Jacobs. And uh, Marianne was a graduate of uh, Clover Park High School in 1966. And in the vernacular, she was, in fact, an, an Air Force brat, her uh, parents both having served in the Air Force, as I recall. And uh, eventually, she found herself serving uh, in the 24th uh, Evacuation Hospital out of Long Bend. So uh, let's talk a little bit about your getting your degree. Uh, where and how does the system work? Okay. I graduated from St. Joseph Hospital School of Nursing in Tacoma, Washington. <clears throat> the hospital is still there. The school is not. There aren't programs like that around anymore. <clears throat> They're called diploma or three-year programs where I received an outstanding nursing education that prepared me upon graduation to be fully functioning as a registered nurse. Um, however, my last year of nursing school, I ran short of funds to finish, and the Army had a program called the Army Student Nurse Program. And this was a program of tuition assistance whereby they paid me a stipend every month, and um, I paid my room and board and tuition and books out of that, and then in return, for that financial assistance, I owed the military two years of active duty service in the Army. Now, because of your military background, you weren't uncomfortable with that uh, as a going into the Army? No, I wasn't uncomfortable with that at all. And in fact, I had always planned to join the military because, as you mentioned, both of my parents are World War II veterans. My dad retired from the Air Force. And I had known nothing but a military life. And I had planned to go into the military, but into the Navy, not the Army. The Navy, however, had stopped their tuition assistance program, and the Army had not. And so I joined the Army. All right. Now, uh, uh, there's a, a real jump, though, between obviously becoming, for instance, an RN in a regular hospital and the military protocol and so, so forth. Uh, how, how do you learn that? Well, as soon as you go on active duty, you go, irrespective of what you do in the military, you go to what's called basic training. And it's six weeks training of how to be a member of the military, basically. Um, how to put insignia on your uniform, how to march. We learned in the military basic training for medical personnel at Fort Sam Houston, all the forms we would need for hospital work, uh, no matter where we were stationed. We learned how to do procedures there that nurses in civilian life don't do. We had a lab to do that. We did a map course. We, um, we learned everything we needed to know to be effective members of the Army Nurse Corps. All right, so as a support to the, the military in the field, I assume that the additional training uh, in the military view is basically dealing with uh, 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 traumatic wartime wounds, so it's everything from bullet holes to blast wounds. Right, and, and to practice that, we were out in the middle of the desert at a place called Camp Bullis, where we set up a field evacuation hospital where GIs who were, or people who were going through basic training who were not in, in the uh, nurse or medical course um, acted as our patients and we played mass casualties. So we set up a field hospital at Camp Bullis and we practiced those things that we would need to know. Uh, we also went out to the firing range where we saw the explosive power of an M16 rifle, which is something if you went to Vietnam you were going to need to know. Um, and they shot up gallon cans of sauerkraut for us that afternoon, made us all sick because it was over 100 degrees and we were all smelling rotten sauerkraut. Um, nonetheless, we also went out to another area of the firing range where the drill sergeant showed us a pistol and basically said, this is where the bullet goes in, this is the trigger, bye, see ya, have a great life in the military. We were not allowed any weapons training. And that will come back later that on That will come back. Story. Okay. To haunt us, yes. Uh, all right, so you've gone through basic. You're now assigned uh, somewhere on the East Coast. Is that correct? Uh, where and what were you doing? Um, I was assigned to Walson Army Hospital, which was at Fort Dix, New Jersey, neither of which exists anymore is my understanding. Uh, and I worked general duty nursing there for almost a full year. And then I got orders to go to Vietnam. All right, so when you say general duty nurse, mm -hmm. uh, but who are the patients in uh, all? Uh, the Walson At Walson. Um, Walson was a fairly small hospital, but nonetheless had a full complement of services. So we treated dependents and we treated returning veterans from Vietnam. We treated all the military personnel who were stationed at Fort Dix at that time. So services ran from surgery and obstetrics 
to orthopedics treating amputations, guys who'd come back from Vietnam, to treating their dependents. So I did a little bit of all of that. So tragically, one of the aspects of this is the multiple amputations that actually took place in the Vietnam Wars. That's but, right. Mm -hmm. So, um, all right, you then uh, get your orders to head towards Vietnam in August of 70 and September you're off. Uh, right. Where are you headed and what's going on? Um, we landed at about 3 in the morning at Benoit Air Base and we stayed there for a couple of hours until we met with the chief nurse of Vietnam somewhere on Long Bin. I have no idea where she was. Um, and then I was assigned to the 24th Evacuation Hospital, which is on Long Bin. All right. So this is actually a Vietnamese airfield located right next right to next a door. major military uh, base. Yes. It was okay. a Vietnamese Air Force base. All right. Uh, so uh, uh, first of all, what's the assignments there in the hospital? How, how, how does uh, um, um, uh, patients are, are uh, typically uh, hill of uh, helicoptered in, mm -hmm. then what happens? What's, what's, what's the process of that? The process of the evacuation system? Yeah. Okay. So the evacuation system was set up in Vietnam so that no wounded allied or American soldier would be further than a half an hour away from the nearest hospital. So to accomplish that, the, the Army operated 27 hospitals in Vietnam. The Navy operated three hospitals, a land-based hospital at Da Nang, and two hospital ships, the Sanctuary and the Repose, that were anchored in the South China Sea. The Air Force had three casualty staging facilities, which I'll come back to shortly. So when a wounded individual, um, th with the initial wounding, the patient is given care by the platoon medic, and he does whatever he possibly can for that patient. And while that is going on, the radio man in the platoon is calling to what we call the dust-off units, and that's the helicopter removal service. That is, they come into the landing, to the landing area in a hot, what, we, what they call a hot landing zone, uh, where the battle is going on, and they airlift the patients out. And while in the air, they, they radio to the nearest hospital what kind of patients are coming in, that is, what kind of wounds they have, and so, and how many, so that by the time they get to the hospital, the medical staff, the physicians who are necessary to treat those kinds of wounds are waiting for those patients in the emergency room. So once in the emergency room, intravenous lines are started, clothing's removed, immediate assessment of wounds takes place, and then the patients go to the operating room. Once in the operating room, the wounds are surgically cleaned, and then they are dressed, and the patients then come to us on the ward. And after recovering from the anesthesia. So where they go in the hospital is based on the severity of wounds that they have and what type of wounds they have. So if you have two amputations, then you go to the orthopedic ward. If you had a spinal injury or a uh, head injury, you went to the neurosurgical wards. If you had surgical wounds like an abdominal wound or a chest wound, then you went to the surgical wards. So where you went depended on which system of the body was most severely compromised. All right, so there are three basic levels of care coming out. Yes. The uh, intensive, the intermediate care. Mm -hmm. And then minimal care. Okay, and which one of those sectors did you work? Okay, um, technically I worked on what, what we call wards two, three, and four, and that was surgical intensive care, surgical intermediate care, and surgical minimal care. Um, we had a head nurse over all three of those wards, and most of the work that I did was in intensive care and intermediate care. Okay. Uh, in in the, 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 the when you first start in your service, uh, you're 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 brought in, uh, you're placed uh, uh, in a ward. Mm -hmm. uh, they begin the process of of teaching you. Uh, the things that you're going to have to do. Now, you, but you ended up as an assistant head nurse about six months in. Yes. What about that, yeah. what, what what triggers all that? Um, basically, the chief nurse of the hospital looks at at competency, experience, and um, psychological stability, among other characteristics, and then awards you, I guess you could call it, um, a position of at a higher level uh, of responsibility. So. I was a staff nurse doing direct patient care and supervision of the nurses' aides who 
we called Corman, um, for several months and then was given an assistant head nurse position. And then a couple months into that, I was given a head nurse position of two different wards. All right, and uh, if, if you had two wards, that's approximately? Anywhere from 40 to 60 patients. Okay. Uh, and uh, um, now for, uh, are, are, are these mainly female nurses that were working in the hospital? Yes, most of the nurses at the 24th of Act were female. We had one male nurse that I knew. If there were other male nurses, I never met any of them. There was only one that I knew. Okay, and what's a common sh work shift like? in we, terms of just timing timing we work 12-hour shifts six days a week so you begin at 7 in the morning you have a two 15-minute breaks and a half an hour break for lunch and then you're off at 7 o'clock at night so if you start the night shift at 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. and the tragic news is all this nice lineage about breaks has no meaning when it has fact, no meaning whatsoever there's a battle going on and right you got folks coming through right. as fast as you can count. And, right. the, and the six day a week thing, that was your official schedule. When we had mass casualties, everybody poured into the wards and into the emergency room and operating room and worked extra. All right, now uh, you, uh, so we, we have a, a couple of different levels of skilled personnel here. So let's start with doctors. Okay. Um, <clears throat> how does the Army get a doctor during wartime? Um, some doctors who are in the military, obviously, they're regular, what we call regular army. Um, they will be assigned wherever. But doctors were drafted to serve in Vietnam. Most doctors that I worked with, however, signed contracts with the army, volunteering to come into the army. If the army would delay their draft or admission into the military until they had at least one or two years of surgical residency completed. And it's in the Army's best interest to do that anyway. What, why is that? Because you want experienced doctors in the operating room. You don't want doctors who have two months of surgical training to be treating patients who, need, who have massive injuries. So you need experienced surgeons. And so if you have a couple of years of surgical residency completed, then you're, you're far more efficient and you're a far better surgeon and you will take better care of the patients that you're treating. All right, in, in, a, in a normal hospital, uh, mm -hmm. surgical procedures typically are done in the morning. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, in, in this type of circumstance, it happens when it happens. Mm -hmm. But if you have a chance, and it's, it's a, for whatever argument's sake, a low-key day, and they're going to go in the morning, uh, what, what actually happens uh, in terms of their care of patients? So they come out of surgery, mm -hmm. what, what happens now? Okay, patients come out of surgery, they go to the recovery room to recover from the anesthesia, and then they are sent to whatever ward they need to be in. So if the surgeons are done with their surgery, they will follow up with those patients in the post-op room and on the ward just to keep track of them. At most, unless there were some complications, doctors saw their patients twice a day. So one of the realities here for those of us that aren't medically trained is uh, it's very rare you're going to get a patient with just a single wound. Yes. Uh, Vietnam uh, is known as the war with the highest percentage of multiple traumatic amputations. Our patients didn't come to us with nice clean bullet wounds, and I know that sounds like an oxymoron, but they are predominantly blast injuries. They are huge gaping wounds that will require multiple plastic surgeries years down the line to fully close. Um, very severe injuries and um, our patients then after coming out of the OR uh, would come to us on the wards and four to six times a day after giving them doses of, of antibiotics, multiple broad spectrum that is covering a lot of different bugs, uh, antibiotics, intravenous fluids, food and pain medication four to six times a day, we would unpack those wounds and clean them. Okay, we'll, we'll get into okay. the details in, okay. in, in a minute. Now, I'm, uh, the other personnel uh, obviously included uh, corpsmen. Mm -hmm. How did that operation work? Who, who are the corpsmen? Who runs them? What are they doing? Okay, the corpsmen are enlisted personnel um, who, if I had to compare them to uh, medical personnel today, you would call them nurses' aides. They did temperatures. Uh, they changed beds, they bathed patients, they um, fed patients, they distributed food through the ward and, and so forth. Um, 
some of our corpsmen had a little bit more training than others and were given a little bit more responsibility. On occasion, we had corpsmen who uh, were licensed practical nurses, and they were given additional responsibility. Those corpsmen basically work under the RN, who is an officer, and um, usually she um, makes their assignments, their duty assignments, what patients they're going to care for on that day and oversees their work. But the corpsmen themselves, their schedules are set by an individual who's called the ward master, and he's a sergeant. He is a regular army, usually, person, um, and he sets their schedules, and he's the one who takes care of all the machinery on the ward. He's the one who makes sure we have pens and pencils and paper, you know, charts that we need, all the equipment that we need, uh, but he's also in charge of the schedule of the corpsman. Okay, so actually can I just make a quick jump here? Mm -hmm. So we need to understand that the military, of course, wanting ultimate best care possible, does have a whole lot of paperwork that has to be processed, and yes. that file has to go with the patient, yes. is that correct? Mm -hmm. And uh, as you as a, when you became the head nurse and you're, mm -hmm. you're running the two wards, you also have paperwork that you have to do with the staff that's serving under yes. you. Mm -hmm. uh, what kind of things are, are being tracked? Um, well, as a, as a head nurse, my responsibility is to make sure that all of the, um, the nurses' schedules are set. So I set their working hours, what shifts they're gonna work and how many days in a row. Um, I also had to do evaluations of the personnel who served under me and um, worked with the ward master for assigning shifts to the, to the corpsman. But I also had to make sure that all the charts were done, that is, all the patient records were up to date and accurate, and that all the nurses had signed off on them. So I had administrative duties as well as patient care duties as a and, and by the way, how many nurses do we have at this facility? If I had to guess, I would say perhaps 80. And are you all living in the same basic area? Yeah, we our quarters were just off the hospital. Now, the very nature of your work also says that probably the people that you have the most common interaction with is your fellow nurses. Yes, and, and the doctors. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so, uh, it, and uh, by the way, uh, the nature of the locale of the Long Bend and, mm -hmm. and uh, as a facility, you're handling all types of patients. What, what uh, uh, let's, let's go through, uh, obviously you've got, you know, Marine, Army, mm -hmm. Air Force personnel coming yeah. through. Who else is coming through? Okay, so in addition to all of U.S. forces, we also treated all of our allied forces. That meant Australians, Canadians, Thais, and Koreans, plus Vietnamese military. We also treated Vietnamese prisoners of war, and we treated Vietnamese civilians when we had the bed capacity to do so. And uh, you mentioned uh, in a prior conversation that particularly the Vietnamese civilians mm -hmm. uh, much preferred American care. What, yes. What's that all about? The reason for that is that the rural hospitals were very poor. The big city hospitals were fine, but for the Vietnamese civilians, their rural hospitals were rat and roach infested, they had straw beds and two or three patients to a bed if they had a bed at all. There were no medical personnel there at night because the Viet Cong would come in and kill them. And so patients were left there in the care of their families at night. And so if we had the bed capacity, we treated Vietnamese civilians because going into their hospitals, their rural hospitals, was a sentence of death. And so we did whatever we could to, to give them good medical care. Um, they also did everything they could to get their loved ones into our hospitals, and that included attempted bribery, lying. We had one man who brought his grandson in and said that he'd been hit by a Jeep, and the young boy, I think he was eight or 10 years old, had a appendicitis, so we took care of him. All right, now, in the mechanical setup of the hospital, you've got uh, 30 to 40 in each, uh, each ward. Mm -hmm. uh, you've got about 15 wards in operation. Right. But your patients don't stay very long. Right. Um, the goal of the hospital system in Vietnam was to make sure that our patients were given immediate life-saving care 
and once they were stable, then removed to a longer care facility. And that was not in Vietnam. That was out of the combat area. Hospitals in Vietnam weren't safe places, and I know we'll get to that later, but you want to get them to a safe place. And so while they're being treated by us on the wards, their wounds are being cleaned out and they're being given antibiotics and so forth. And then they go back to the operating room to have the wounds surgically cleaned again. This is usually the second, sometimes the third day after the initial injury. Then they, they come back on the, to the ward and they recover from the anesthesia. But the next day, they are loaded onto a helicopter or a bus and they are taken to that Air Force casualty facility, whichever one is closest to the hospital that they're at. And they stay there overnight in the company of the Air Force nurses. The next morning, they are loaded onto a hospital plane operated by the Air Force and flown to Japan or the United States. Okay, so it, 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 you know, it, initially that sounds very strange. What you literally have is open wounds, but it, it has something to do with the nature of where these people are coming from, what they're right. encountering. What causes that? What, okay. what, what are you medically trying to get at? Medically, you want to make sure that your patient stays infection-free. So if you close up a wound, if it's even possible to close it, that's a whole other issue. If it's possible to close up a wound, you generally don't do it unless you absolutely have to, like an abdominal wound. The reason for that is that our patients were coming to us out of jungle, or they were in rice paddies where there was fecal material or leeches. Um, they, were, they had insect larvae in their wounds depending on how long they had been out in the field. And so if you try to close those wounds surgically, you're inviting massive infection that can kill your patient before you can do anything about it. So the wounds were not closed in the operating room. They're packed with gauze and dressed, and then they come to us on the ward, and as I mentioned earlier, we clean those wounds out, surgically clean them out four to six times a day after giving the patients pain medication. And then when they go back to the operating room, they are surgically cleaned out under anesthesia and then packed again, not closed. They would be closed later on in Japan. Okay, so uh, 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 grimly, that means that, uh, uh, well, first of all, if you had uh, 30 beds full in, in your ward, it, you're going to spend a great deal of time just trying to beat the infection by yes. literally irrigating open wounds. Yes. So I, I Picking mean, out debris, sort of, you know, and this is all done under sterile conditions. We're using sterile instruments, sterile gloves, and then we redress the wound. Okay, but it's, it's, it's got to be very wearing as an individual. It can be, and I, and I won't fudge on this. It is very difficult to treat massive traumatic injuries for young men who are your age or younger. I mean, so if people watching this, imagine treating your best friends who have these massive horrible injuries that are going to require medical treatment for years afterwards. Well, there's the, if I can divert, it's, it's the irony that in fact seven out of eight young men who were drafted during the Vietnam era failed the physical. So the people that are actually serving are at the peak, at of, the their peak of their vitality and, and yeah. capability and now suddenly they're coming in mm -hmm. with desperate needs. And yes. it's, it, it, it has to, well, I mean, you yourself are only in your young 20s. Yes. It, 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 it has to take a toll. It, just, it does. It takes a toll. Um, all right. So uh, th 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 um, there were some, uh, uh, one of the difficulties is, is that you don't actually know what happens to the patients that you serve. I That's mean, right. We don't know what happened to any of our patients because we, they were with us three, maybe four days, unless they were very severely injured and they couldn't be evacuated. So we never knew what happened to any of them. And only on one occasion did we ever get a letter from a patient um, saying, you know, that he's, he was fine. Okay, but, but from simply a human standpoint, given the traumatic injuries that you're dealing with and the fact that they're a, an ongoing flow of this, mm -hmm. you must turn to your inner circle for support, yes. conversations about things that don't have anything to do with the ward yes. and, and the rest of it. We worked very hard, but we also socialized very hard, including parties. Um, you're in the military. As officers, we were not supposed to fraternize. 
with enlisted men, but the enlisted men were some of our best friends. They're our corpsmen. We're with them 12 hours a day, and the doctors. So we all partied together. We socialized together. We had picnics. We had dinner together. Um, and so we relied on each other a great deal. We so formed exceedingly close relationships with one another. So you literally create artificial events to basically mm -hmm. get your mind off of what you're dealing yeah. with on a daily basis. Yeah, and I will say that those relationships are some of the closest relationships of my life. And all relationships are when they're forged under those circumstances. Uh, and, and speaking, unfortunately, of some of those uh, traumatic moments mm -hmm. of things that you witness while on the ward, you made a comment about the level of care and competency. Mm -hmm. uh, would you, wh what did you mean by that? Well, I will say that the, the Army, to their credit, probably gave us some tools to be prepared for what we would do and see in Vietnam. But the truth of the matter is there was no way they could have prepared us for the intensity and type of wounds that we'd, we would be seeing. Um, and so that meant when we got there that we had to learn procedures that nurses today still don't do, like inserting chest tubes and doing modified tracheotomies. I, I, explain that to me. Yeah. Uh, wh so, what would be the purpose of that? Well, when a lung collapses, it needs to be reinflated. And to do that, you insert a chest tube. And you don't have doctors. If they're in the operating room doing surgeries for mass casualties, you don't have somebody that you can call to come in and insert a chest tube or to give the patient a new breathing, breathing way. Um, you have to learn how to do it yourself. So we did a variety of procedures, and we learned how to do them. And the reason that this became very intense for us is because we went over to Vietnam just like the guys did. We did not go with a unit. So we came over as individuals, and that meant that we were always having new people come into the hospital and experience people leaving. It meant that we always had somebody that we had to teach a new procedure to. And once we were satisfied with their competency and had observed them doing it, then they could do it on their own. And by that time, it was time to teach somebody new how to do it. So we learned how to do a lot of procedures. And similarly, the nurses who worked with medical patients had to learn a lot because that's the one thing the Army did not do for us that they should have done for us, and that was to give us a course in tropical medicine because we saw diseases in Vietnam that, if we were lucky, we studied about in nursing school but had never seen in this country, like leprosy and blackwater fever and plague and malaria, of course, was endemic in Vietnam, meaning that it was widespread throughout the area. So they were similarly challenged. Irrespective of that, the survival rate for patients who were admitted to hospitals in Vietnam was 99%. Well, that's absolutely stunning. And it is an amazing number. It, yeah. It what it what it requires is a huge number of specialized, trained mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. to basically make the system work. Yeah, and and I have to say that the evacuation system that I described earlier is in part due. I mean, that's a huge part of that number because patients who made it to our hospital alive would have never made it to the hospital in Korea or World War II. And that is part of that huge number. Now, speaking of patients, there are those difficult moments when you have to observe uh, patients in, in their recovery, and mm -hmm. you see acts of heroism even there. Could, could you take us through one of those? Sure. Um, I remember a young man, and I always refer to him as a young man who displayed a level of caring and compassion that I have not seen equaled. And, and I have to say that that was true for my entire tour in Vietnam. But this young man I remember very clearly. I do not remember his name. I don't know where he was from. I think it was somewhere in the Midwest. Uh, but he was about five, seven, and he was red-haired and freckle-faced. And he had a hole in his back that was literally this big around. Um, and he could hardly move himself. And he was going to require years of hospitalization for plastic surgery to close this wound in his back. But every day that he was with us, which was only two or three days, he would pull himself out of bed and he would get fresh water for the guys who couldn't get out of bed or he would help feed a guy who couldn't feed himself or he'd empty a urinal. And he tried to help the guys who could not help themselves. And that wasn't atypical. That wasn't unusual. The guys recognized that they were all in a bad situation and even though they didn't know each other, they were all helping one another. And it was an amazing experience to see that. Um, 
I like, I very often tell students when I give lectures on this that Martin Luther King Jr. would have been proud of us because we were judged based on our character and our ability to do our job and that was it. Nobody cared about where you went to school or who your daddy was um, and what side of the tracks you grew up on. People took care of one another and they cared about one another irrespective of anything else. So one of the things that uh, happens in civilian life is uh, separation of duties and particularly separation between nurses and doctors mm -hmm. is a theme that gets played on. But uh, y you made the remark that uh, in your service in the 24th at Back Hospital that you um, actually had very good relationships with doctors mm -hmm. in terms of understanding what you're doing. Right. What we had amazing doctor-nurse relationships. They were closer than doctor-nurse relationships. They were friendships as well. And they were, they were professional relationships based on a level of trust. They, the doctors readily admitted that we knew their patients better than they did because they saw them in the OR, they saw them on rounds once or twice a day, but we were with their patients for 12 hours a day. And so when we called a doctor up in the middle of the night and said, get yourself over here, your patient's got to go back to the operating room, there was no questioning. They knew they could trust our judgment, our nursing judgment, and they got there. And the hard part, even for them, is, is uh, well, for argument's sake, uh, how long could they actually be in an operating room if there was a major engagement? Oh, they could be there for 12, 15 hours a day. I mean, depending so on... So you're basically yes. clearing people through, and you're doing the best you can, mm -hmm. but you can't know everything. That's right. That's so right. it does fall to the nurses to spot the irregularities mm -hmm. and the temperature spikes and right. whatnot. Right. Uh, uh, you, you uh, fortunately, uh, you did get the opportunity though for a reunion. We did. Yes. When when did that occur? Where did it occur? And what was going on? Last summer. Um, I went to Branson, Missouri, where the 24th Evacuation Hospital had a reunion. And I saw people there that I haven't seen in 43 years, and it was an amazingly wonderful experience to be reconnected, to finally see people that I may have corresponded with or just heard, you know, second or third hand about. It was a, it was a wonderful and self-affirming reunion. It was great. Well, the, the reality is uh, it, it's probably the most intense uh, period of anybody's life when yes. they're they're basically jammed up against emergency process mm -hmm. and the necessity and trying to save lives. Yes. Uh, the uh, uh, and and at the reunion you had uh, 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 Corman. Corman nurses and doctors. Right. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. It was it was wonderful and we you know one of my Corman for example got in touch with me about the reunion and he said. He wanted to thank the nurses that he worked with because they were his role models. And he, after he left the Army, went to nursing school and ended up going b back into the military but in the Navy and is now retired. And two of his sons are nurses as well. And he credits us with the direction his life took. I mean, it's, it's those kinds of experiences that uh, were very gratifying to hear about. It's wonderful. Yeah, and sadly it's because there's a need. Yes, there is a need. Okay. Um, you also talked earlier about tropical diseases, mm -hmm. uh, and of which malaria uh, was obviously a, a part of the, uh, uh, the, the country that you were serving in. Mm -hmm. uh, how did the military uh, basically set up to deal with that particular challenge? Okay. We were all required to take anti-malarial medication. It's a pill that we took once a week, uh, and unfortunately most of the nurses and doctors at the hospital where I worked stop taking those pills because of the side effects. Um, chlorpromaquine is the pill that we took primarily and you have to take this pill once a week and generally it gives you the worst case of abdominal cramping and diarrhea you have ever had in your life and that lasts for three to four days and there were no bathroom facilities for the nurses or the doctors on the wards. We had to go back to our quarters and so in essence we couldn't do our job for three or four days a week if we took that medication. So there had been no documented cases of malaria deriving from long bin itself, and so we felt safe stopping our medication. So 
We, so, uh, we, we kind of lied because on Monday morning when you go in for breakfast, you had to sign a paper that said you took your pills. So we picked up the pill and then quietly put it back down in the bucket and then went off to breakfast and did our job. But none of us got malaria, fortunately, because it's, it's an offense. It's a punishable offense in the military if they give you the means to provide, uh, to provide um, protection from a disease and you get it, then you're at fault and they can punish you for it. So, so actually, you can be court-martialed. Can you not? For well, they give you what's called an Article 15. It's a disciplinary action. Um, you can get an Article 15 for getting sunburned and not being able to go on duty as well. So, yeah. Yeah, but <laughs> but this one would be a little... This is a little more long-term. Little, yeah, mm -hmm. there's, there's mm -hmm. some issues there. Uh, all right. Uh, the uh, We've talked a little bit about the uh, psychological stress mm -hmm. of basically uh, dealing in the words. And not everybody can hold up under that. That's right. Most which is understandable because yeah. it depends upon what mm -hmm. circumstances you came from and what you encounter. Right. But what, what, what do we mean by psychological stress in that type okay. of situation? Well, when you're, when you're working in a civilian setting, you're, tra you're treating patients on a day-to-day -day basis, and you meet their families, and you see them recover, and they go home. None of that was the case here, unless we had a Vietnamese child in the hospital. Um, it is difficult to deal day to day with the intensity and severity of wounds that we were seeing of people roughly our own age. And not everybody was capable of handling that. In general, the more experienced you are in nursing, the longer you've been in the military, the more mature you are as an individual, the better you are able to deal with it. And in fact, kind of what we used to call psychologically putting up the walls so that you did not deal emotionally with what you were seeing and doing every day. If you allow yourself to deal emotionally with that, then you will not be effective at doing your job. And our first job was to save lives and to get these guys back home safely and hopefully to live out a full life. So nurses, just like doctors and just like people who were combat veterans, suffered later on from what is now called post-traumatic stress disorder. And go ahead. Okay. So, uh, and, and actually, I'm going to uh, jump tracks because mm -hmm. we're going to come back to that topic later on. But the uh, so we have a picture of the 24th VAC mm -hmm. uh, hospital, and uh, it's got a clear landing zone uh, on the uh, uh, upper side mm -hmm. uh, of the picture. And but you weren't allowed on. In the where the helicopters landed and and so forth because well, sometimes, of the nature of the job. Well, we weren't we were allowed to take patients off the helicopter who were coming into the hospital. What we were not allowed to do was to be in the helicopter when the dust off unit picked them up in the landing zone in the combat area. We were not allowed to be in helicopters in general, but we were not allowed to go around the country in helicopters, and we were not allowed in the combat zones. But you did actually get. A chance to fly. Yes. Uh, um, there was an Australian hospital at um, a little town called Bung Tau, which is on the South China Sea. It's a beautiful little resort town. And initially the Americans had a four-ward hospital there that actually a friend of mine worked in. Um, and the Australians took over that hospital. And so about midway through my tour, we had an official exchange program with the Australians where two of their nurses came to our hospital to work and, and to get experience because they weren't set up to treat the severity of patients that we were. So they came to our hospital to work for a week, and we went to their hospital to get a tour and work a little bit, but predominantly to play in the surf. So it, uh, but the, 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 the catch is, and I think the military did fully understand, they had to give you breaks. Yes, I mean, they uh, did. Because yeah. you're and we, we did have a week R&R. &R. I went to Hong Kong. Um, this was another kind of in-country rest and recreation, which is what R&R &R is. Um, but we did work at the hospital at Bung Tau. Uh, their nurses certainly worked at our hospital. Uh, well, and, and sadly, I mean, that's, that's how you get trained personnel mm -hmm. that can handle the intensity of, of, of the activities. That's and right. It, experience counts. Mm -hmm. um, all right. Uh, but you actually faced fire. Yes. There. Is that correct? What happened? Yes. Um, none of the hospitals were safe places. And in fact, the first four nurses to get uh, Purple Hearts in Vietnam were Navy nurses who worked in the hospital in Saigon. 
So there were no safe places in Vietnam. There were no clear front lines. And that meant that hospitals got mortared. 68% um, of the women in the, in the research that I did were in hospitals that received incoming mortar fire. That included the hospital where I worked. Um, about 30% of us were in hospitals where there were snipers who came in either to kill patients or to, the week before I got to the 24th, they caught a guy putting dynamite or some kind of an explosive device in the air conditioner for our ward. Um, and 15% of the nurses had occasion to defend themselves or their patients against enemy soldiers. And this is with a operating policy that you don't train nurses on how to nurses. handle a gun. That's right. So, um, all right. Uh, so, it, you're uh, uh, you're now at the end of your tour of duty. You've been there mm -hmm. 12 months, mm -hmm. and uh, w uh, where are you going to go? What happens? Well, I, I was flown to uh, Travis Air Base, and there I officially separated from the military, and even though I had a commitment, commitment for non-active reserve for several years. I don't remember how long it was, two years, five years, I don't remember. Uh, and then I flew to Seattle, and um, I actually went from there to New York, where my fiancé was, and we got married. And then we moved back out here, where I worked for several months at Tacoma General in their intensive care unit. And then I went to Madigan, where I worked for four years. All right, so uh, some students may not know what Madigan is. Okay. What is Madigan? And Madigan is, is a huge Army hospital that is um, it's now on the, what they call the Joint Base, Lewis-McChord, uh, Air Force Base and Army Base. Uh, and Madigan is a, a huge Army hospital located there. And the bulk of these are? Bulk of the, bulk of the patients are returning patients from Vietnam, um, dependents of, of military personnel, uh, and military personnel who are stationed at Fort Lewis, McCord, uh, Camp Murray, uh, sometimes but very rarely Bremerton, because they have a Navy hospital in Bremerton. Um, and both the, the nursing staff there is both military and civilian nursing staff. And, uh, and uh, uh, by the way, do you get veterans going to Madigan? Yes. So uh, these and are- And their dependents. Uh, used at that time, yes. And, mm -hmm. and uh, so uh, patients coming back with long-term medical care- Yes. They may be living at home, but they're gonna have to come in for s procedures, yes. checks, and-, mm -hmm. and that Surgeries. Sort of all right, uh, you, you then realized uh, you had your second child, is that yes. correct, mm -hmm. in that, that time period? Yes. Uh, by the way, what are the names of your children? Oh, my son's name is Matthew. He's the elder, and my daughter's name is Amy. Okay. And uh, you, so you, you determined that the GI Bill uh, was going to run out on you time-wise, and mm -hmm. so you determined to go to grad school. So where are you going and why? Okay. Well, first I had to finish out a bachelor's degree. So I went to Tacoma Community College for a year, and then I transferred to the University of Washington where I finished a degree in anthropology. My original intent had been to get a master's degree in nursing and teach, but since I was three, I wanted to dig up Egypt as well as be a nurse, or so my mother said. So um, I went into anthropology and started studying um, medical systems in other cultures and healing relationships and perceptions about health and healing. And so when I graduated from the University of Washington with a bachelor's degree in anthropology, I was admitted to graduate school there and I finished a doctorate in anthropology and my subfield is now medical anthropology. So I've combined the two greatest academic loves of my life into one field. And it's rewarding. It's wonderful. Uh, and your doctoral thesis mm -hmm. was uh, centered on what were you actually looking at? Yes. Um, my doctoral dissertation was on the Vietnam and readjustment experiences of nurse veterans. And it was a nationwide study, the largest study to date done by an individual. Okay. But why wouldn't the military basically be keeping track of all the various groups that serve? When when the military wants information about repercussions of war and so forth, Congress usually mandates studies to be done. Congress never mandated until almost 1988, I believe, that women be included in any of the post-traumatic stress disorder studies and readjustment experience studies that were being conducted. So, so nurses were not included long after. 
Uh, and uh, even even the diagnosis of post-traumatic stress, mm -hmm. when does that show up? That shows up in 1980 after an international conference um, defined the perimeters of the diagnosis and it becomes an official diagnostic category of the American Psychiatric Association in 1980. And uh, out of curiosity, uh, what are the uses of that particular study? Not of simply post-traumatic, mm -hmm. but specifically on women. Okay. Well, because women had been included in none of the studies that had been done, the local vet centers, which were located all over the country, there are several in this area, um, had no idea what to do with women when they came in because none of the issues that women may have experienced in Vietnam had ever been studied or delineated. P the psychologists who are running these centers, some of whom are veterans, they don't have a clue what women's issues are uh, and how they might be similar to or, importantly, how they are different from that of men. And as a consequence, they didn't know what to do with women. So when my study came out, I had vet centers from all over the country asking me for a copy of the study, which I more than willingly sent to them. Um, they could also access it through the Seattle VA because the Seattle VA has a copy of it because they gave me a fellowship to do the research. So they got a copy of the dissertation and it's also in the UW library. So the, what's going on here is wanting to prepare for future conflicts the military uses studies to basically assess what has gone on, but in this particular case, it's those that take care of patients are not considered as patients, yet they clearly are. Yes. The, the guiding ideology of ignoring nurses was that nobody expected that nurses who are, after all, just doing their job, that was the phrase that was used, should ever experience anything as a result of having done that. So they were ignored, basically, and not just by the military and the government, by the civilian authorities as well, because some nurses who were having problems went to civilian psychologists, and they never asked them about their experiences in Vietnam. It never occurred to them that that experience could result in some kind of psychological problem. Well, it's, uh, it, it's, it's, it, unfortunately, it's one more cost. In it is indeed. In, in a military action. Well, uh, Marianne, uh, if you don't mind, uh, I'm going to close here. This has been uh, conversations about the Vietnam War, and my special guest has been Marianne Jacobs, currently a professor at Green River Community College. Thank you so much, Marianne. Thank you.